Hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, welcome to our event from Ice Age to the A83. This is the latest talk from SAGES, the Scottish Alliance for Geoscience in Environment and Society. I hope you're all having a lovely evening and it's as sunny and warm as it is here where you are today. Uh, my name is Graeme and I'm going to be your host for the evening. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the housekeeping before we get uh, before we get started. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session this evening. So please do ask any questions you might have via the Q&A box. It's down at the bottom of your screen on the very right. Uh, we won't be monitoring the chat just quite as much, so questions go into the Q&A box. Uh, but if you do have any problems, uh, do put those in the chat. Uh, the lovely Hannah today will be looking at that. So if you can't hear me, then you don't know what I'm saying. I'm very sorry. But um, if you have any problems throughout the night with visuals or with audio, please do just ask Hannah in the chat there. And also to let you know, the session is going to be recorded and it will be made available on the SAGES YouTube channel after the event. Also, we do have a hashtag because we're young and hip. Um, it's hashtag Sages Stories. We're going to put that into the chat. So if you love what you see, uh, please do tell your friends on all the social media possible. Um, now, what's going to happen tonight? Well, we're going to get a talk for about 30 minutes from Professor Emrys Phillips, uh, and I'm going to introduce him a little bit more in a moment. Then we're going to have a question and answer session and a discussion. So please do come up with your questions, start thinking about them now. Uh, and I'll be introducing our panel uh, before that. Um, and we're going to finish tonight somewhere between 8 and 8.15, just depending on how many questions we get, because we want to get through as many as possible. So before we begin a little introduction to who SAGES are, um, they're a research pool and they're comprised of researchers working across Scotland in academic institutions all the way from the tippy top of Scotland in Thurso down to Edinburgh and they work on cutting edge environmental and societally relevant topics. Now SAGES has a number of themes and each theme has a group of researchers working together on similar topics. Now this month, as you might have guessed, our focus theme is landscape, form, use and change, or in other words, our dynamic earth. Now landscape science is hugely interdisciplinary and the researchers look at all sorts of temporal and spatial scales to understand how our physical environment has formed and also what changes are happening even right now under our feet. This is the third event in the Sages Stories event series held up in held in the run up to COP26, which is the big climate conference taking place hopefully in Glasgow at the end of the year. In this series of events, we want to share the excitement and the challenges of finding scientific solutions to climate change through engaging the public with research happening across the country today. And our event series is going to span topics all the way from peat bogs to the Arctic ice, from green prescription to hydroengineering. So there is so much more to learn in this series. And if you'd like to find out about future events while well, you're in luck, you can sign up to the mailing list, which is going to go into the chat down below. Now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Professor Emrys Phillips, who is the SAGE's co-theme leader on landscape. Emrys is a senior research scientist at the British Geological Survey in Edinburgh, where he's worked for about 30 years. And the specific project he works on tries to reduce how vulnerable our infrastructure and our biological systems are to sudden change. And within that project, he is the science lead for the Seafloor, Coasts and Landscapes Research Program. And honestly, after you look at the Seafloor, Coasts and Landscapes, I'm not sure what is left for other people to look at. Uh, now, as an earth scientist, he's worked, and I'm going to read all these countries out. He's worked in the UK, in Iceland, Canada, Botswana, Egypt, Germany, Poland, the UAE and Oman, and increasingly works offshore in the North Sea, Irish Sea and Bristol Channel. Emrys, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just share my screen and we can get the event started. Right, where are we? View, full screen mode. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, 
I think the presentation this evening is very much for anybody interested in our landscape and how we interact with it and how it affects us. Hence the sort of title to tonight's, for tonight's sort of uh, event as From the Ice Age to the A83. So I thought I'd start off by posing a sort of Monty Python style question. Uh, so what did the last Ice Age ever do for us? And um, because, you know, we think of it, it's, it's something in the past, it's gone. It was a major climate change event. So instead of the Romans, what did the Ice Age do? When we think of the landscape in Scotland, we think of the mountains and the Scottish glens. But over the past year, I think really the great outdoors, getting out there, cycling, walking, whatever you do, go and sit in the, in the, in the green spaces, reading the newspaper, as really come to the fore and helped us cope with the current situation of COVID as we see ourselves in. So it's good for us, hence the green um, sort of ideas that the medics are putting forward, the doctors are putting forward, good for our mental and physical health to be outdoors in the Scottish landscape. And that landscape is a product of the last ice age. Education, a fundamental part of what Sages is about, but it doesn't matter whatever age you are, from infant school right the way through to university and beyond. The Great Outdoors is a brilliant uh, natural laboratory. You can go out there, all you need is your eyes, that's the only technical equipment you need, and you can see what the last ice age did on the landscape. And that helps us understand what is happening today in, say, Greenland or in uh, Antarctica and the impacts that climate change is having on Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets and other glasses around the world. Some more slightly ob obscure things, farming and soils. You know, well, what did the last ice age have to do with that? Well, the soils we have around Scotland and elsewhere in the UK are largely based on glacial sediments. And so as those sediments break down, they're the parent materials of the soils, as they break down, they release nutrients, which go into the, the crops that we grow to feed ourselves and our animals, and therefore they can affect our health. So a lot of the soils in Scotland, the sort of green fields of East Lothian or uh, of Eastern Scotland, Aberdeenshire, are all based on glacial sediments. So it's important for our farming and our agriculture touches on that as well. Scottish rivers and seed locks and mountain locks, all those areas that fishermen love for trout and salmon. A lot of the big Scottish rivers owe their origins to the meltwater rivers that formed at the end of the last ice age. So, you know, very important to the Scottish economy. And I've put in sort of whiskey in there as well. If you ever do a whiskey tour at a distillery, they tell you all about the pure natural water. That water tends to come from groundwater which percolates through glacial sediments and it's a natural filtering system. So not only for the whiskey industry but for our groundwater, our drinking water also has a touch of the glacial about it in that it is filtered by glacial sediments. As I said we tend to think of the Scottish landscape in terms of the mountains and the glens in either the, the highlands or the southern uplands of Scotland. But our city landscapes are also glacial or partly glacial in origin. This, the photograph you can see on the left hand side is, is an aerial view of Edinburgh and it shows Castle Rock with a castle and the Royal Mile. That is a large glacial landform known as a crag and tail. And ice was coming from the east, rolling up Prince's Street, and split and went around and over the top of Castle Rock, leaving a long tail of sediment, which now has the Royal Mile sitting on it, going down to Holyrood Palace. And that is a single glacial landform. So it's, it's quite a long feature. And just in front where Princess Street Gardens and the um, railway is, that used to be a loch. That's an over deepened area, been scaled out by the ice, used to be a loch, the Norloch, and, but at some point in the past, the good burghers of Edinburgh, living in the old town, used to use it as a bit of a rubbish dump. So a, a, a sort of old theme 
you know, we started to pollute the landscape and the Norlock was drained because it became so heavily polluted. So even Edinburgh's city landscape has a touch of the glacial about it and uh, part of the last ice age is, is preserved in our city landscape. So this is, seems like a, if you like, an advert for the Scottish tourist industry. Uh, visit Scotland, a landscape fashioned by ice. And that's actually quite true because a lot of the landscape that the tourist industry advertises and uses to promote Scotland is a glacial landscape. I mean, we've got Sullivan and Canis here with the glaciated lowlands in front with the small lochs. This is an ancient landscape and it is the basis of a multi-million pound industry which brings visitors into Scotland. So very important. So let's have a few facts and figures about the last ice age. So we, we see how we interact with it and why it's important to, to people living in Scotland. So let's have a few facts. Um, the last ice age is, was now, is known by scientists as the Devensian glaciation. And it's a, a period of major climate change which started about 120,000 years ago and ended about 10,000. And estimates suggest that the ice sheets covering Scotland and elsewhere reached their maximum about 20,000 years ago. Now, these all seem like large numbers, but to a geologist and a scientist who actually thinks about the history of the Earth in billions of years or millions of years, this was last week, if not even sooner. And at that time, the ice sheet covered the whole of Scotland and a large part of the rest of the UK. And the image, the satellite image from a uh, NASA image from is the UK when it was covered in snow during the winter of 2009-10. And it gives you that sort of flavour of what, you know, Scotland and the rest of Britain would have looked like. That ice sheet was quite thick and in the Million Valley, so that's the central belt of Scotland, you know, Edinburgh, Glasgow belt, that was out over uh, nearly a kilometre thick at times. So that's quite a thick ice sheet. So Edinburgh Castle Rock would have been completely covered. In fact, Arthur's Seat would have been completely covered as well. That ice sheet didn't just cover the land, but it also extended offshore and filled a large part of the North Sea, the Irish Sea, the Heb on, on the sea surrounding the Hebrides and Shetland. So it was a massive ice sheet. And the Devensian glaciation, the last glaciation, was just one of a number of ice ages which occurred during a period of time known as the Quaternary. And that started about 2.6 million years ago and we're still in it. So it's carrying on today. Right. So what causes the fall in temperature? What gives us our ice age? There's a number of theories. I mean, there's changes in the atmosphere which can in cause climate change. We're seeing that now with the, the current phase of climate change. There's fluctuations in the ocean currents. Now, in the UK, we're really lucky. We've got the Gulf Stream, which keeps us relatively cool in the winter, in the summer, but also warm in the winter. If that current was to switch off, which some scientists are suggesting, you know, uh, due to the increasing fresh melt water going into the oceans as the ice sheets melt, we may have a climate more, uh, sort of weather more like the eastern side of Canada. So a bit more like Newfoundland. So warm summers, but much colder winters. But one of the main uh, changes, uh, one of the main influences for producing falling temperature is the change in the Earth's orbit. These or, what are called orbital for, forcing Milankovitch cycles. Now, instead of going around the, the sun in a nice circular orbit and always being tilted at the same angle, the Earth, I'm afraid, wobbles a bit. It goes around in a sort of eccentric orbit, orbit uh, which is elliptical. So when it's closer to the sun, it gets more radiation. When it's further away, it, it gets less. So it gets colder or cooler. And that occurs on a, a 100,000 years cycle. The second is a change in the tilt. 
So it's, it's swaying backwards and forwards. And that ang uh, angle of tilt is about 41,000 year cycle. And then the third one is the precession. And that occurs on 23,000 year cycle. So it's literally just wobbling around the sun and taken together, that affects the amount of solar radiation we receive. And that can affect the amount, the, the temperature and therefore the climate and the cooler periods allow the ice sheets to grow. And the image on the um, left hand side of your screen is the artist's impression of the what the earth looked like with a big ice sheet covering the pole and goodly parts of northern Europe during the last ice age. What you can see now is a sort of on the right hand side is a uh, temperature curve constructed for the, the part of the quaternary and it shows how the temperature fluctuated. It wasn't sort of like a switch, one minute it was cold next minute it was warm. The temperature fluctuates and we get warm periods called interglacials and cold periods called glacial periods. And so during the last ice age, as the temperature fell, we got a cooling climate and became cold maritime. So the photograph at the bottom of the screen sort of gives you a flavour of what that may look like. Snow, heavier snowfall during the winter, perhaps staying longer into the, the spring and summer. Then we get when it's really cold, the ice age climate, glaciers and ice sheets expanding. And then at the end of the ice age, we get the warming climate and we get the re-establishment of the Caledonian forests and the vegetation. And we can see that warm climate preserved in the pollen record within peaks and things. So sort of touching on some of the other um, sages events later in the year. So what do we see in the landscape? Well, it's not just the glaciers. We also get features formed by the cold climate. This is a, a view of uh, Svinafell area in southern southeast Iceland uh, when we're in, it was April, field work it was this time of year, a few years ago now, but you can see snow on the ground. So it's the cold that's causing these features. And here we have a photograph of the grey corries. And this is, and I did, you know, it shows you the effects of literally the cold on rocks. It can cause them to shatter. And during the summer, the ice melts, percolates into fractures. During the winter or overnight, it freezes and expands. And slowly, 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 that crack widens and the rock falls apart. So all this shattered rock and scree that you see in the grey quarries is effect of the cold. These mountains may have stayed above the ice quite some time and resulting in a feature called a non-attack, sort of exposed rock sticking up of the uh, ice sheet. Those cold processes, that freeze thaw can continue after the, uh, the glaciers are retreated because the climate just doesn't suddenly warm up and we get these large screech slopes on many of the sides of the big mountains like the ones here in the Coolins and you can see these large screech slopes forming these discrete cones which are partly vegetated but some of them are still active so those even during the you know during the coldest winters those screen slopes are still active today so those glacial those processes started after the glaciation are still continuing today the glacial environment itself the glaciated valley this is one this is Skafterfellsjökull in Iceland beautiful place if you ever get the opportunity to visit but they're really complex. So we've got the rivers in front, the glacial fluvial rivers taking meltwater away from the ice. We've got moraines forming where the ice is pushing up the sediments and bedrock in front. We get lakes forming of meltwater where the water's ponding. We get the glacier itself and the glaciated valley. And then all the moraines, the medial moraines forming from a, you can see a little bit of bedrock sticking up out of the ice fall with this long stringer of bedrock rich ice fall forming down the glacier. So very complicated uh, systems which leave their mark on the actual landscape. Now when I was at school the U-shaped valley was the classic glaciated valley but there's more to it than that. There's a whole life story here and this 
valley is thought to be originally a headwater of the early River Forth. It was then glaciated, ice came down it as the ice retreated. You got meltwater deposited a flat layer of sediments in the bottom. Here's the modern river snaking its way, meandering its way down. And then we've got slope processes going on. And these form, these paraglacial slope processes form these fans and talus slopes coming off the top of the mountains, which then become vegetated over time. So this valley, although it's the classic U shape, has actually had quite a significant period of history preserved. And what we're doing as, as scientists and landscape scientists is interpreting that history and piecing together the processes which occurred after the last ice age or during the last ice age. We get moraines. So the moraines are these little ridges going across and they chart the position of the ice as it retreats back up the valley. In Iceland, the glaciers there retreat back during the summer when it's warmer, they melt back, and then during the winter they move forward. So some of these moraines may actually be annual features. And in Iceland, you can actually date them. So if you went back year after year, you could see which moraine was formed and you could put time sequence. And they've been doing that and they've shown that in the past five years, a lot of the glaciers in Iceland are retreating at an exception increased rate. So that is an effect of climate change preserved in the landscape. And you can probably see these big boulders, these grey spots on the photograph. Those are the erratics, those big blocks that have fallen onto the top of the ice and been deposited at the side. So these moraines are formed by ice pushing up at the front, pushing the sediments up at the front, but also material melting out of the ice and sloughing down as this almost like a wet slurry actually uh, in front of the glacier. If you get a chance to go to Iceland or one of the glaciers in the Alps and look around the front, they really do look like a badly bulldozed building site. Very complicated, very dynamic environments and um, quite noisy when the rocks and ice is cracking and falling around you. Meltwater. We all think of the nice pure white glacier, but a lot of the landscape change is also done by meltwater. This is Gulf Foss in Southern Iceland. As you can see, I've got a bit of a thing about Iceland for photography. But this is quite close to us. This, well for me, this is near Dunbar. And this channel you can see here with nice flat bottom meandering down is a meltwater channel which formed underneath the ice. The Gently rolling farmland, you can see on either side, was the original bed of the ice as it flowed from Edinburgh, having carved the crag and tail of the Castle Rock and Royal Mile. It then flowed across East Lothian and out to sea. There's the big uh, cement works near Dunbar. So this is a river of meltwater actually flowing underneath the ice, taking meltwater from the surface, put, goes its way down and then actually flows along the bed of the ice. So looking at these features, understanding the sediments within them, the processes going on to form these helps us understand what's happening underneath Antarctica today. Then we get water flowing through the ice itself. You, know, you always think of a glacier as being almost like a big solid ice cube, but it's actually riddled with holes and fractures. And that's exploited by the meltwater. And you can see these, hopefully see these ribbons, these ridges, and these are composed of sediment. This is at Carstairs. So again, another Scottish example. And these were rivers flowing through the ice and the sediment is left behind. The ice disappears and you're left with these long ribbons of sediment. And there you've got the modern river, Clyde next door. These uh, contain so much sand and gravel that they're actually extracted for building materials. And talking about building materials, meltwater leaves behind thick sequences of sand and gravel. We've already mentioned that it's used as the parent material, it's parent material for uh, soils which you grow food, but also it's building material. And sometimes they contain very large blocks like this one here. Please be aware this photograph was taken in the 1970s. Uh, so this chap standing here with his uh, tank top on, very sort of classy 
sort of fashions in the 70s. It was before health and safety was uh, invented. So, you know, we can see he hasn't got his high vis jacket or hard hat on. But these blocks could either have fallen from the, the surface of the ice as big erratics, or alternatively, meltwater could be stored underneath the ice and then suddenly burst out as these outburst floods or Yokel Alp, uh, Icelandic word meaning outburst floods. And they can cause in, you know, rectal damage. And you can get um, the amount of water coming out in minutes can be the same as the discharge of some of the world's largest rivers. And so in Iceland, it, you know, Jokul Alp in the past have actually wiped out the road that goes around Iceland. So as these, you know, this meltwater builds up underneath some of the glaciers, some of the people living in front of those glaciers start to get a little worried because you don't know where, when these events are going to occur. In Iceland, they're driven by the volcanic eruptions underneath the ice. Ice can get buried and trapped underneath the, uh, uh, sediments as it retreats and you get these features called catapults. And there's one uh, on the Isle of Egg, large size feature there with the uh, lake in the middle of it. These can have peaks inside and as the ice retreats, you get kettle holes forming with peaks in. So you can actually date and chart the climate change as the ice retreats. So these are just a few gratuitous uh, photographs of me, me I've taken on fieldwork in Iceland. I've been lucky enough to go there over the past few years. But they give you a sort of an idea, a flavour of what Scotland would have been like during the last ice age. Um, so some of these valleys, you know, that you see in Iceland, a spitting image of what Scotland would have been like. Glencoe may have looked like the top photograph. So why is understanding the last ice age so important? I mean, I think hopefully we're starting to see that much of Britain is a, is a glaciated landscape. It could, that white line on the image on the left hand side is the limit, maximum limit of the Devensian ice. So it covered much of the northern Britain and actually went as far south as the Scilly Isles in the Celtic Sea and Irish Sea, so down here. The black lines are these ice streams, these faster flowing corridors of ice which regulate the size of the ice sheets. So. For the majority of people living in Britain and also in Scotland, glacial sediments are the foundations on which we build our homes, hospitals, roads and other infrastructure, power stations, a source of building material, a source of groundwater, educational resource, but also that they can become uh, saturated with water which can lead to flooding or landslides. So they can represent what we call geohazards, affect us. And that ice didn't, as a, the map on the, on the left hand side shows you, didn't stop at the coast. It went offshore as well. And that's quite important for the, some of the things we're doing to try and combat or cope with climate change. So here's just a few examples. It has impacts on our roads and railways and other infrastructure. This, this shows why we've got the A83 in our title this evening. Photograph on the right is on the road closures fairly recently, 28th of August last year. The road is only just opening again. That road was inundated by debris flow. And you can see on the left hand picture, the, the road going across with a few sort of vehicles on it with mass flows coming down, the debris flows coming down off the side of the mountain. And that is the rest of going up to the rest of the thankful pass. That's really important because it's one of the main, it is the main route linking to part of Scotland. And it estimated in one of the closure periods of about 15 days, it cost over 1.2 million pounds in lost revenue for the area to the north, which is linked by this road. So glacial sediments on the move can, and forming these debris flows can have a serious impact on what we do, how we live our lives. This is some work done by a colleague of mine, Andrew Finlayson, and the map on the left shows you the distribution of all the glacial sediments and paraglacial sediments 
and the black line is the road. So the road goes through all these segments. And it also shows you on the road, the images on the right hand side, shows how steep those um, slopes are. So the, the map here, most of the slopes where those debris flows are coming from, dip at 30 to 50 degrees, so very steep angles, and they're mantled by unconsolidated sediment. So basically you add water after a significant rain event and it weakens the sediment. And when that happens, you get a debris flow. So unfortunately with the increasing intensity and frequency of the big rainfall events, you know, quite a few of the roadways in upland areas, both within Scotland and elsewhere, in say the Lake District or in uh, potentially in Snowdonia and elsewhere in the world, could suffer similar consequences of mass flows being generated within the glacial sediments. This is a coastal, these glacial sediments also occur, occur on the coast. And that's uh, the top photograph is a photograph of a, a landslide coast on a side strand in Norfolk. So we've gone south a bit, south of the border. And then another one, which only happened just a, a few weeks ago, uh, is a washout on the coast, the glacial sediments. Uh, near Haysborough. These sediments are really weak and so with increasing storminess, frequency, size of storms, but also with start rising sea level uh, due to melting ice sheets during climate change, the frequency of these type of landslips and erosion of the coast will increase. So parts of our coast where we got these glacial sediments are quite vulnerable to this style of erosion. So it's quite important we understand what's happening, the processes, the sediments, the distribution of the sediments, and how climate change is going to impact on those to make our coast resilient. We've gone offshore. This is a the data you see there with the beautiful colours is uh, multi-beam data, it's bathymetry offshore. And the, the examples here are from Anglesey, just off the coast of North Wales. The little map shows you that. And these, these little blobby sort of features are actually landforms formed beneath the ice. They're the feature called drumlins. And the shape of them tells you the direction in which the ice was flowing. So they're almost like little geological signposts. The ice went that way. And so we can see how the ice was flowing down the Irish Sea towards the Scilly Isles and forming these landforms underneath the ice. And it's thought that the longer they are, more spindly like, like some of the ones here, the faster the ice was flowing. The more stubby and equant, the slower the ice. So you can almost see from this part, that's fairly stubby, to this part here, they're more elongate, you can see where the ice is speeding up into the center of the Irish Sea. And this is, these are sections through, the drumlins, and they're composed entirely of glacial sediment. These are on Anglesey, uh, exposed on the west coast of Anglesey. Uh, beautiful part of the world, well worth a visit. Now, that glacial landscape goes further offshore. And you've probably heard Dogger Bank. Some of you may have heard it if, you, you know, if you've got a bad case of insomnia and you're listening to the shipping forecast on Radio 4 late at night. Dogger Bank is one of the, the areas they use. And if we could go back to the last ice age and do a weather forecast, it would be, you know, ice imminent, rain turning to snow, winds, poor visibility, but it would have been land. And that's one of the things that sometimes we forget is that you could have walked, this is pre-Brexit, walked from Edinburgh right the way across to Europe via what they refer to as Doggerland. And the image on the right hand side is a horizon within those sediments taken from geophysics data, survey data, collected by a wind farm company. Because the Dogger Bank is also an area of shallow water where wind farm companies interested in putting in a large wind farm. And these arcuate features are the moraines. 
which preserved the shape of the ice, which filled the North Sea during the last ice age. And then in between these areas, these greener areas, are the sedimentary basins where the glacial sediments were being deposited. And the processes affecting the sediments, forming either these big moraines where it's been pushed up and squeezed, uh, they're harder, whereas in between the sediments are just laid down horizontally, they're softer, they affect the ground conditions you want to put your wind farm in. And that affects the design of your turbine foundations. You know, so it could cost money, but also the layout. So if you understand the glacial environment preserved in those sediments below the seabed, you can actually target where to put your wind farm. So there you get the easiest and cheapest no, cheap, sorry, more cost effective, that's a better way of saying it. it's not cheap, cost effective way of putting in your wind farm, but also where it can catch the most wind and be most effective at generating power. To give you a bit of a hint, initial predictions suggested that the Dogabank wind farm was going to produce potentially 10% of the UK's energy need when it comes on stream. So that's the whole of the UK, 10%. So that's quite a lot of energy from one large wind farm. Now that map, sort of, you don't really get a, an idea of the true scale. So what I've done, I've popped it onto Scotland and that's that southern moraine arc. So that which was formed by ice coming down from the north. And for those of you who know the Edinburgh area, the back end of that moraine arc is in the fourth. The front end is outside to the south of the Edinburgh City Bypass. So that, if you want a disaster movie, if, the, if you roll the ice down during the last ice age, it would have completely buried Edinburgh in the moraine being pushed up in front of it. And that gives you, uh, that map actually gives you an idea of the sense of scale of these offshore wind farms. So understanding the glacial sediments is actually finding solutions in terms of developing wind farms to the present climate change uh, problems that we're facing. So what did the last ice age do for us? Well, apart from great outdoors, natural water resources, soils we grow our food, Scottish tour industry, great natural, uh, nat natural laboratory for science and education. It has a direct, the sediments and landscape has a direct impact on our lives. And really, understanding these processes and how the landscape changed during and after the last ice age is helping us find solutions to the problems being current, caused by current climate change. And I will finish there and go on to any questions and I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Amaris. That was absolutely fascinating. If Zoom allowed for it, there would be a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I should put that button on next time. <laughs> um, so please, <clears throat> yes, do please ask some questions uh, to Amaris uh, and the rest of the panel in the Q&A box. Just a reminder, it's down at the very bottom of your screen on the right. Uh, now, what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to introduce the rest of the panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to give them a couple of questions that we've received from Twitter. Um, and then we're going to get to your own questions uh, about the talk from Emirates. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Rebecca Wade, who is a senior lecturer in environmental science at Abertay University in Dundee. She's also waving at you. And she's the co-leader of SAGE's landscape theme with Emirates. Now, Rebecca's research focuses on ecosystem services, river restoration, sustainable water management, blue-green infrastructure, and how society interacts with nature. And if I had to focus on all of those things at once, I would definitely have a headache. So well done, Rebecca. Uh, she teaches environmental science and technology. Ambassador, a gender equality champion, a fellow of the RSA, and a board member at the Dundee Science Centre and the Esk Rivers Trust. Uh, she's currently concentrating her research on river restoration to our well-being as a means of addressing the climate and biodiversity crises. So thank you so much for coming on, Rebecca. 
The second member of the panel is William Harcourt, who is a PhD student at the University of St Andrews. Now, Will develops new remote sensing techniques, hello Will, uh, new remote sensing techniques to monitor dynamic systems such as glaciers, snow, to the Scottish Avalanche Information Service. Will also applies remote sensing techniques to Arctic systems, helping map things like glaciers and glacier. And he says, as glaciers move, they erode, and therefore the best place to look for evidence of past glaciations is offshore. He's fascinated by the seabed and seabed maps created by multi-beam sonar, which sounds very James Bond and exciting. And in particular, he's interested in the use of autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs to help reveal Chile and in various sites in Africa. So thank you so much to all of our panel and I'm going to go straight into questions. Uh, John, we have a question uh, from Twitter that says, at the end of the last glaciation, did the ice sheet retreat at the same time from Scotland all at once, I think. John, would you like to feel that? Oh, thanks, Graham. The, God, that's, a, that, that's, um, that's a good question, actually. Emrys has given us a, a lovely talk, talking about the, um, the ice sheet. Um, and of course, we have to think about what, well, so ice sheets, ice sheets are made up of glaciers and where glaciers um, join together, they can form ice streams. So ice streams, as the name suggests, and Emrys showed us some lovely seabed imagery there. That's the kind of stuff that gets me out of bed. Um, uh, submarine, submarine drumlins, that's, that's great stuff. So ice streams move uh, a lot quicker. At the end of the last glaciation, I think Emrys said it was about 20,000 years ago. So the ice sheet would have retreated at a different rate in different places, depending on whether it was a glacier, um, uh, an ice tongue, or whether it was an ice stream. So those ice streams would have collapsed a lot quicker and they would have retreated um, perhaps 150 meters uh, a year. And of course, we're seeing a similar kind of scenario in, uh, in places like Greenland and in Antarctica. So if we nibble away at our ice sheet, uh, nibble away and we lose those ice streams, eventually that will make the ice sheet itself quite vulnerable. So we have different rates of retreat and potentially as we nibble away at our ice sheet will lead to catastrophic collapse and we'll lose our ice sheets. And that is what happened, of course, to the uh, Scottish uh, ice sheet, or I should say the British Irish uh, ice sheet. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've got a question now, well, a couple of questions actually uh, about climate change. And I think I'm gonna lead the first one of those towards Will. Uh, and it's quite simple as a question, but I think it's going to be quite a, quite a, a wide scope of an answer. So will climate change affecting Scotland's landscape and how is it doing that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it is a really broad question and a really difficult question to challenge to take in, in two minutes. But I guess the main thing really for Scotland is that Emma's gave a really good overview of how Scotland's landscape has, has been shaped by, by glaciers. And you can see that, especially in the West, you've got these large mountain tops with steep sides um, and in the East, not so much, but plateaus and, and, and corries. And, and really, the, these, uh, these landscapes are really now um, quite vulnerable to sudden changes. So we can see now that with climate change and warming temperatures that there's, a, there's an increase in extreme events, and, and Ember has touched on this in, in his presentation. And those extreme events are leading to um, more, more rain, more storms, um, and that those kind of events are now 
making the vulnerable slopes of the of the landscapes more vulnerable to change. So an example is the rest and be thankful, but also there are other examples in Scotland, such as in, on the railways. So there was last year an unfortunate yeah, last year an unfortunate instance where there was a landslip on a railway which caused a train crash. And we can see that through the, the extreme weather events and these uh, these changes that it's now impacting humans. So whilst the landscape is changing to, to, due to climate change, we now have to use these environments in a very different way. We have to monitor them better. We actually need to understand how they're changing and what rate they are changing. But we now need to mitigate the changes that are happening and develop new ways to use them and, and start to think about how we can caution use of landscape in certain areas. There's also a certain element of Scotland's landscapes that's changing. Um, it's changing every winter, it's changing every season. So over the last winter we had lots of snowfall, in fact we had uh, one of the best winters in the Highlands in many many years, except for the fact that most people couldn't make it to the Highlands because of the, uh, the lockdown. But because of these extreme weather events we had lots of snow coming through in February and within about two weeks all that snow left, it all just melted away. These, these massive changes are really affecting all the people that work in these areas and live in these areas. That's farmers, it's tourism, it's ski areas, um, it's hydrologists that depend on this for, for various reasons. So it's affecting the landscape in many different ways and we still don't necessarily understand the, the rate at which is changing and how we can use it to, to our advantage. Um, so that was kind of a, a shortish answer to what is quite a broad question and quite a, a difficult challenge in general. It is indeed. And it's always just fascinating how when you start talking about climate change, everything just ends up being linked together. It's, it's really hard to, piece, to, to take anything apart. Um, so, Rebecca, on the same theme, we've got a question in from Twitter. So, Graham, you've broken up for me. Um, if you're back with us, could you repeat the question? I'm going to turn it off my camera and find a place with better internet. So Rebecca, just of the same question in how Scotland's landscape can help us adapt to climate change. Got it. Thank you. Got it that time, but uh, not an easy question to answer indeed, uh, Graham. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so how can Scotland's landscape help us adapt to climate change? Well, you know, we know from research by uh, Nature Scott and many others that um, climate change is as well suggested. And, uh, you know, and in fact, Emrys pointed out beautifully lots of different ways in which uh, different conditions can really affect our landscape. We know there's going to be extensive um, impact Scotland's landscape. And we also have got a pretty good idea that the main changes are likely to be in the lowland and coastal areas where the population is the highest. So that means that we are going to really have to think hard about how we adapt and mitigate those uh, climate changes that, that are pretty inevitable. Even if we took very extreme action right now, um, there are changes that are locked into the system that we know are going to happen uh, regardless. So we need to make changes right now in terms of uh, stopping the carbon emissions, but the ones that have already been emitted are going to cause changes for us. So how can Scotland's landscape help us in that situation? Well, expanding and enhancing our understanding of nature and actually working with natural solutions is going to be part of the way that we do that. So by understanding, protecting and working with natural processes, we can do an awful lot to, to mitigate, that's to sort of reduce the impacts of climate change and to help ourselves adapt to climate change as well. So just very briefly, what might be some of those working with natural processes, those nature-based solutions that we could employ? Well, it could be things like sand dune restoration and salt marsh expansion to help um, improve, er, um, reduce erosion and improve flood protection at our coasts and to sequester some of that carbon in coastal areas. It might be protection and restoration of peat bogs in the upland areas so we can store carbon and, and restore the hydrological cycle, the nat natural hydrological cycle, just making sure we're keeping those peat bogs wet and, and have them functioning properly. It could be um, coming down into the sort of more urban and lowland areas, it could be uh, creation and restoration of blue and green infrastructure, helping communities to be more resilient, 
reducing the flood risk that they're facing in their local environments. And that even reducing the urban heat island effect, uh, there's been situations across Europe in recent years where um, very hot temperatures in urban areas have caused uh, public health issues and indeed fatalities. So, you know, even though we're in Scotland and it's not terribly warm this evening, you know, these are the sorts of things we're going to have to plan ahead for. But as we're doing that and using nature to help us do that, we're managing the stormwater, we're reducing the heat, we're storing carbon, we're creating better habitats for people and for pollinators and for urban nature and just helping all of us be able to, to, to make that adaption. So whether it's restoring rivers and wetlands, enhancing coastal and uh, natural protected protection systems and coasts, it's those nature-based solutions, uh, working with nature rather than against it that's going to be crucial, I think, in helping us to adapt and helping Scotland's landscapes to help us to adapt to climate change. Thank you very much, Rebecca. As you see, I have now changed venue to a new place. Hopefully my internet connection will be a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to go to some of the questions that we have uh, received in from the people listening today. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about the A83, the Rest and Be Thankful Road. So I think I'm going to start with those. Uh, and it's, I'll, I'll kind of join them together. One is, is questioning to what extent overgrazing might be a factor in landslides on the A83. And there's also apparently a, a woodland creation project uh, on the slopes to try and prevent uh, landslides in the future. So, so, so how are these sorts of factors uh, going to affect that in the future? Uh, that might be a, a, maybe we'll start with Rebecca or Emrys. Do you want to take that one, Emrys, to least start? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the problem with the A83 uh, is that the, the real crux is that it's a very steep slope through down there. And also that that is mantled by unconsolidated sediment. And be, up until recent, relative, I mean, there was one or two events, usually a year, that sort of closed the road for, you know, a day or two. But the events are becoming more frequent. And so what we do in terms of, you know, sort of mitigating was the term that Rebecca used, that, that sort of trying to, off, you know, stop, <laughs> basically, you know, switch off. The, the, these uh, slope processes, we need to work out how to do that. Um, we need to understand the sediments. And, you know, those sediments piled up when they're vegetated, they're relatively stable. But when we start building on them, not necessarily the 83, but other areas, and um, Will mentioned railroads, we disturb that balance. We take, you know, put a, put a ditch through it, or we put a road through it, or a railway through it. We quite often destabilize the slope. So when we add water, it does slide, you know, and, and that's the problem that we're seeing there is that add water on unstable slope. So whatever we do has to try and stabilize them again. And, um, you know, that could be, you know, planting trees, but it is a very steep slope. I wouldn't like to be employed to go up and down there. Overgrazing in some areas in Scotland may be a problem, but I think on those slopes, it's a very hardy sheep that grazes the slope at 50 degrees. So I think overgrazing there may not be such a big issue. The problem is we've put a road through an area of unstable sediment, and unfortunately it's causing us issues um, and I'm sure the engineers uh, who are looking into that now, the engineering companies, are trying to work ways around sort of solving those issues. I would just add, uh, exactly agree with what Emerson has said. And um, I just did my PhD a long time ago on hill slope processes, including, you know, waterborne soil erosion, which really feeds into to this topic. And, and we do know, I mean, the, the audience is quite right in that vegetation makes a huge difference to slope stability. But on the other hand, Emrys is quite right in the sense that this is a very steep slope. And so sometimes it's a bit like sort of rock, paper, scissors. You know, you can have um, you can have the rock, you can have a really stable uh, kind of vegetation cover. But the paper is going to trump that card in the sense that the steep uh, slope is just so steep 
that even with good vegetation cover, it's just not going to be enough to keep all of that substrate in place. So when we think about slope stability, we think about things like what is the soil or the rock type? What is the land use cover? And what is the slope? So those are three sort of major factors in terms of thinking about um, slope stability. And in this case, it's just it's a really steep slope and it's also the most convenient route to get through that part of Scotland. And so we kind of have a bit of a, a bit of a clash with uh, the, the land use that we want to have and the landscape that we have to deal with. Yeah, go ahead, Will. Yeah, just uh, the, the both, both very good answers. I just wanted to add that one way in which we could mitigate or not, not even solve, but help is to, to monitor uh, the landslide over time to, to see actually how it's changing. We, we know that landslides happen uh, almost suddenly, if you, as, as Rebecca said, if you have the right water content in the hill slopes. So if you had a way of monitoring the, the landslide so that you know it's about to be triggered, that's also something that the, the agencies can do to tell people not to go through that route. Now, I know they're trying to build a road in a separate location in the Glen, but that might still affect the road. So if we had some mechanism through satellites or through something on the ground that says we know it's about to to to, to have another landslip, that would really help um, the, the agencies and the road network, I think. Um, so these are, the, the, I think this could be thought of as a thing for the whole of Scotland. Monitoring all the changes is really, really important. And that actually leads to a nice question uh, that we got from Twitter. How, how do we monitor those landscapes well? What are those techniques? Yeah, so there's a number of techniques that you can use. So there's satellites. So satellites can be used to map the whole of, of Scotland almost daily, actually even, even more than a day. So we can look at things that are happening over the course of a day sometimes or over the course of a week through satellite imagery. But one of the ways in which I'm trying to, or a method I'm trying to develop is radar. So radar um, is, a, is an active sensor that transmits a signal and you send it back. But the really, really cool thing about radar is that you can see through clouds and you can see in the dark, which is pretty incredible. So if you had, which we all know in Scotland, it has very changeable weather conditions and we often have lots of cloud, um, a radar sensor can see through the cloud and you can look at changes underneath the cloud cover. So just recently I was in, uh, in the Northern Cairngorms measuring snow cover and we were trying to look at changes in the, in the snowpack over a few days. And the Northern Corries um, in, in, in the Northern Cairngorm region were covered by cloud almost the whole time we were there. But it didn't matter because we could see through the, the cloud and measure the snowpack. So radar is actually one of the best things for Scotland with the, all the cloud cover you get because you can look at uh, the changes through through those weather conditions. Um, so that's one way you can, can, can monitor. And I think that's a really useful solution uh, to monitoring in, in Scotland. Great, thank you very much. Rebecca? Yeah, I'm just going to say, I um, absolutely agree with Will. It's super that we're using a combination of sort of traditional monitoring techniques. In fact, we've been sort of monitoring river levels in Scotland for more than 100 years. So we've got a century of data on our river levels and we didn't start monitoring them to understand climate change or, or, or sort of nature-based solutions. We started monitoring them to understand water supply and, and all sorts of different things, but we've got that record. So uh, we've got this 100 years of record of understanding the levels of rivers and we can apply that to trying to understand the rainfall patterns over time and now we can say that we know that the annual rainfall in Scotland has increased by 13% since 1970. So in a half century we've had an increase in rainfall but we also know through the monitoring that it's not just increasing uniformly across the year that we're having more intense rainfalls and those are of course leading to maybe some of those extreme situations like the, uh, the flooding and even the landslips because if we get highly saturated uh, conditions and then more rain or indeed snow melt happening on top of those conditions, then we're more likely to have these more sort of catastrophic or extreme um, sort of landscape processes occurring that we need to deal with. So really understanding that long uh, history of data that we've been collecting in Scotland, the, the scientific analysis that's been going on uh, it, within individual disciplines and across different disciplines working together, uh, is really, really strong in Scotland, which is one of the amazing things about SAGES because it brings lots of different expertise together to, to work together so we get a better understanding. Um, but also things like um, using old fashioned surveying, you know, putting a tripod up and understanding the tiny details of the landscape, whether you're, you're studying the, the peat bogs in the flow country and understanding how the levels of the peat bogs change or 
whether you're doing something like I do, which is monitoring how a restored river is adapting over time, uh, or indeed, you know, getting uh, folk like Will, who not only use radar, but use drone surveys. So instead of me having a tripod and a whole team of people, you know, you might have one person and a drone that can cover a whole area in a short period of time, even using different spectral signatures. So using um, different technology and different ways of understanding the landscape to give us levels of information and detail that, you know, we've not been able to collect before. So, um, yeah, it's, it, getting that information, understanding what's happening, seeing the trends, and then being able to pinpoint the places to put the, pros, to put the solutions in, I think is, is really going to be one of the ways forward. Absolutely. Thanks, John. You had something to add? Yeah, well, I, I thought I would chip in. Um, uh, Emrys, Emrys showed us a nice, a nice slide of, I think it was the U-shaped valley in Balquida, and showed that uh, the talus slopes and the, the colluvial fans, the, the, the material being shed off the sides. And I suppose landslips are a way of the, the landscape responding to change. Rebecca's just telling us about adaptation. And so I suppose it's a it's a question from me to to the panel. Um, at some point, I suppose, would it is it is it fair to say that the landscape will naturally find its equilibrium? And it doesn't help us driving on the A eighty three. But at some point, is that reasonable to assume that the landscape will naturally find its find its its equilibrium and the slope stability will be stable? Who wants to feel that? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that was really kind of that question. I, I, I like that. No, it's quite right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Rebecca and John are right. We've got to work with the landscape. You know, we've got to understand it to know what it wants to become. So like where there's flooding, where's it going to go to? And then how we can work with it and produce these green solutions. I think... One of the things for me, I mean, yeah, I'm an aged scientist, but when I see all these, we've held the mirror up to everybody and gone, look, it's going to hell in a handcart. Now it's time to actually start giving us solutions. And so Rebecca touched on some of the green ones that we're doing and John's touched on another. We have to understand the landscape so we can help the engineers and the planners and the, the decision makers to say, look, guys, if you let do this here, it stabilizes it. It's going to be less of a problem than there. So, you know, that could be a, a debris flow burying the road occasionally, shift your road and point where it's not going to affect. I mean, it costs us, but in the end, it costs less than keeping <laughs> repairing the roads. And then Rebecca touched on the, uh, the river system that she's uh, sort of letting regenerate having probably been put into a channel you know watching those systems work naturally means that our towns and cities you know higher up in the system aren't going to get flooded because the system's holding back that water and dealing with it in a natural way rather than putting it in a concrete flue which gets it through and out and into your backyard <laughs> as, as quick as it coming down to the sky as rain so I think these are proper solutions and that's what we can be doing. That's what Sage is. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've been with Sage just a few years now and I've just been impressed by, you know, the early career scientists, the PhD students like Will and others, how they're coming up with these solutions. And they're, they're fantastic. And that's, that's what good science is about, coming up with answers and solutions. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I mean, you've been involved with Sages for about two months now, and I'm extremely impressed as well at, at the amount of at the amount of coordination and, and everything that goes on. Um, that's led actually got sort of topics led to a couple more questions that we've got from the live audience, which I'm going to try and get to because um, uh, I'm aware of the time. So are any of you working with Adaptation Scotland uh, to help local governments in becoming resilient to the changes that are coming? I don't know who to throw that one to. Um, I could tackle it. Uh, I'm not directly working with Adaptation Scotland, but I know that Adaptation Scotland are working with universities more generally. So uh, there are certainly um, different teams where Adaptation Scotland is working within different higher education institutions. And that probably involves the research pools like 
sages, the one that we're in at the moment. Um, so thinking about different ways of involving communities within the research. Uh, there's another question later on about citizen science, and that certainly does feed into this question about Adaptation Scotland. So it's really important as researchers that we try and communicate our science appropriately, that we work with the stakeholders, including communities, as well as businesses and engineering companies and planners and and um, you know other kinds of more official uh, bodies. It's really important that we work with communities as well because this is a problem that we all have to face together. Uh, not necessarily the A83, but certainly the climate change adaptation and mitigation. So um, organisations like Adaptation Scotland are absolutely brilliant. Uh, they're a really good interface between communities and, and higher education. And they also uh, deliver lots of really good training. So um, you can get involved with Adaptation Scotland as an academic, just as you can as a member of the public to sort of get some information and training. So um, I can't say that I'm working with them directly, but I know that they're um, a really useful portal for that interaction across communities and academia. Great. Um, because you mentioned it, are there any citizen science, citizen science projects to do with uh, landscapes in Scotland, geology, getting people involved? Uh, yeah, Will. So I know of one which is not specific to Scotland, but is more global. So uh, a few years back, I was working with Edinburgh Napier on mapping seagrass in Kenya. Now that's far flung from Scotland, but there was a project called Seagrass Spotter. And Seagrass Spotter is a citizen science uh, initiative to help find seagrass in, in every place, every corner of the world. Now, seagrass uh, is, it's not literally grass under the sea, but for the purposes here, that's effectively what it is. And you get seagrass in, all around the lochs in, in Scotland. And what Seagrass Spotter wants to do is to get people onto the beaches and take pictures of the seagrass, put it online. And this is the way that they're trying to map the whole coverage of seagrass in the world. And if you have a map of seagrass, all the seagrass in the world, and if we have it for Scotland, we can look at where the seagrass is and where it, it isn't, and if that's changed over time. So that's one citizen science project that I'm aware of. And I, and I really like that project because it means you can have fun on a nice sunny day in, in on the Scottish coast and, and go and find some seagrass. And I think that's a really nice way to, for people to get involved. Let's go on. Yeah, Rebecca. Just a really quick add on. Yes, there's loads of citizen science going on in Scotland. Absolutely tons. Uh, so whether it's through a portal like Nature Scott, that's the organisation that used to be uh, Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, so Nature Scott, I've got loads of advice on what you can do to get involved in, in um, citizen science. Uh, also the conservation volunteers, you know, organisations like that, that give loads of opportunities, not just for volunteering in nature, but also taking part in citizen science. And then even Scottish Government, if you go on the Scottish Government website, there's loads of advice there about how to get involved. And that's without even mentioning a lot of the specific citizen science projects that are going on separate to that. So, uh, yeah, loads happening. It's a really good question. So do get involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can see that uh, Hannah has put in a link in the chat to some citizen science stuff and I could get on my soapbox, I could talk about it all night, uh, but I'm not going to, not yet. Uh, right, just so I can say I've got through all the questions, I'm going to do a couple of possibly very quick uh, back to Scottish geology questions um, before we wrap up. Uh, so does anyone know the oldest age for peat found in a kettle hole in Scotland? This is, this is a nice niche question. Anyone, anyone will feel that? No, nope, I think that's a go away and find it out yourself, but pulling <laughs> thanks. Sorry, I think much. I should know, but I don't, yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> um, oh, yep, brilliant. Um, and I did, this is one that just fascinated me. Um, Scotland, we mentioned it last time, is it sinking or is it rising due to effects from the last ice age? This, this has always fascinated me as a question. Who wants to take that, Emrys? Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I mean, I believe it stopped. <laughs> it stopped rising. <laughs> I, um, I, I think that yeah, the, the rebound after the. I mean, when you put a, an ice sheet on something, it and it's sitting around for you know hundred thousand years, it tends to make things go down, and it's only just recently. I couldn't tell you when, which week whether it was last week or the month before, but it has only just stopped rebounding. So it's just come up. So 
now we're at that point what's it going to do next uh, and some of the monitoring you know satellite monitoring that will was talking about that might help us decide what it's going to do whether it's just going to sit there or whether it's going to sort of bounce up and down a bit because it's yeah. incredible the response. slowest the slowest seesaw known to known to anyone yeah uh, <laughs> So, so we can't be we can't be smug anymore and say oh London's sinking and Scotland's rising because, <laughs> because right. uh, I'm afraid oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the seesaw stopped but it also means we can't be complacent about sea level rise we can't go oh, well we're rising so we'll be fine uh, we really can't so um, you know we can't say well it's a problem for somebody else um, never mind our emissions making it a problem for somebody else. It might actually affect our um, local sea levels as well. Sorry, John, did I steal oh, your thunder? Yeah, that's spot on, Rebecca. That, that was all I was going to say was the old seesaw, the old seesaw model of the south coast of the UK uh, sinking and Scotland. It's as if John's locking up. John's gone now as well. Yeah, I, I just want to add, you know, we're talking about it being a slow seesaw. If you're a geologist, actually it's quite bouncing up quite quickly. It's a bit like a rubber ball, because to me, you know, I've worked on sort of ancient gneisses which formed a continental crust, as well as more recent glacial things. So, you know, to, to a earth scientist working on three billion year old gneisses, the continental crust, sort of what's happened recently with the rebound is actually quite quick. Well, yeah, I will, go on. Just to follow on from what Emma said, scale is or temporal scale is really the massive thing here. Uh, we're talking about geological time scales. I'm looking at two time types of time scale really. Snow that that's really hours to, to days. You know, snow can fall one day and then melt the next. And then when you look at glaciers, they're flowing at well, depends which glacier you're talking about, but maybe a meter a day for for some, maybe even up to ten meters a day. Um, but then events such as carving events where the iceberg tips off the edge, that happens momentarily, like instantly. So it's really a matter of scale. And if you and it, so many different scales with so many different processes. Uh, within the same landscape and that that's actually one of the biggest challenges is actually understanding if that's changing as well brilliant so we are coming very much to an end sorry john you're back and it just i think this is a, a final yes no question uh maybe with a, a tiny bit more but do you think scotland's going to be covered by ice again in the future geologically speaking are we going to have another ice age Oh, that's a good question. Is that one? Is that one for me? Um, I think I think the answer is probably not. Uh, if if we keep warming, if we keep warming the climate like we are, it's very it's probably very unlikely. Um, uh, I was unfortunate enough. I did a I did a BBC show years ago uh, with a well known uh, geologist from BGS. Wasn't Emrys? Um, and I said I, I, I gleefully said something about the about uh, Oban being flattened by glaciers. Um, so it's not the case. We, we, it's, it'll be very unlikely if we have another, another ice age like we've seen in the past because of the accelerated warming that we're seeing. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I've indulged myself now too much with all these questions, but I hope everyone has enjoyed this event. So I really just want to say thank you. Thank you to all our panellists. Thank you to all our attendees, uh, sages who've made this event possible. Uh, I just want to do a quick reminder that Hannah's just posted to sign up to our mailing list for future events. We're going to do more like this and they're going to be awesome. Uh, we've also got our ongoing March Sages Stories event. It's a competition called Waterwall in Motion, and everyone is invited to submit videos of how they use, monitor, or protect local water resources, a bit like what we've been talking about. So um, there's apparently a range of exciting prizes available. I don't know what they are, so please don't get back to me if you win and don't like them. Uh, and again, there's more detail going in the chat. Uh, and finally, we've got our next event in May, which is all about global processes. So we're going to be stepping up and looking at the landscape, uh, to how our oceans, our atmospheres and our earth all interact together and a shift under a changing climate. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I hope you have a really lovely evening and hopefully we will see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>